Hello, hi, I'm Craig Callender. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of California, San Diego. Um, and this is... I'm Julian Barber. I've been an independent theoretical physicist uh, pretty well all my working life. I'm now 72. Uh, I've been concerned above all with two really foundational questions. What is time? What is motion? Uh, recently, I've been made a visiting professor in physics at the University of Oxford in England. So that's who I am. And uh, we're talking for about, uh, we're about eight hours time zone apart and 5,000 or more, more miles away from each other. Um, but I can hear you pretty well. And uh, let's start things off with uh, talking about a paper that Julian uh, wrote that recently won uh, first prize in an essay contest on the nature of time. Uh, the essay contest was run by the Foundational Questions Institute, at FQX, and uh, Julian's pr uh, paper is uh, called The Nature of Time, and it's really a uh, well-deserved uh, uh, win there. It's really a wonderful paper. And so it would be natural to start off uh, uh, with Julian describing the paper, and then I'll ask some questions to try to bring out some of the, the distinctive aspects of this uh, work. Well, the paper, the, the subject uh, of the essay competition was the nature of time. And, in fact, unlike most of the other entries, I, I took this very seriously and tried to say exactly what I thought time was, not uh, hugely ambitiously within Einstein's general relativity, but within something much more basic uh, and fundamental, really, in, in terms of the history of the subject, uh, how it all started with Newton. And the question above all that I addressed is, uh, how do you define duration? What does it mean to say that a, a second today is the same as a second tomorrow? Now, Newton, in his uh, famous Principia in 1687, gave a, a famous definition of what he called absolute time, which he says flows uniformly without relation to anything external, and he says actually specifically that if nothing whatever were to happen in the universe, uh, the viewer may be able to see me smiling a bit now, so something is happening, but Newton says if absolutely nothing were to happen, if everything froze in the universe, time would still pass uniformly. And so according to Newton, time exists before anything else, uh, and, it, and it passes uniformly. And there's a very nice quip of uh, Richard Feynman which sums that up. He said, time is what happens when nothing else does. And the aim of my essay was to argue that that's really not the right way to think about time. Perhaps I've spoken enough for, uh, for the moment. Uh, Craig, do you perhaps want to come in with any comments of that before I go on? Um, no, I think you could go on. I, th I think, uh, well, maybe uh, for the audience, uh, um, separate, uh, you know, in the Newton quote, the, the duration, uh, you know, what, what, what uh, you think is important about duration and how duration was, uh, everyone talks about Einstein and the relativity of simultaneity, but uh, that, I, that the other question you're interested in um, uh, about duration has, has been... Uh, not discussed as much. Yes, that's that's. A, I think that's a very interesting thing. The uh, in, in fact, it was in 1898. The famous French mathematician and ast um, astronomer. Well, no, he was a mathematician really, but he knew a lot about ast astronomy. Henri Poincaré wrote a paper called "On the Measure of Time," and he said that there are two fundamental problems uh, to do with time. One of them is to do with the definition of duration. As I said at the start, what does it mean to say that a second today is the same as a second tomorrow? And then he said there's another issue which hasn't really been so widely recognized, but how do you define simultaneity at spatially separated points? How can we know that <laughs> my now is, is Craig's now in California? I'm sitting in deepest North Oxfordshire in the heart of England. So um, Poincaré said this, this is quite an issue. Uh, 
And he then went on to explain how the astronomers had had to grapple with the problem of defining definition because for two and a half millennia there had been just one standard of time which was provided by the rotation of the Earth. And in fact it was the or rather the stars moving around uh, as they appeared from the surface of the Earth. And that had provided an incredibly accurate clock. It, it's actually lost only a few hours in, in, in uh, two and a half thousand years. So that's a very impressive clock. Very easy to use. Astronomers only just had to glance at the night sky at the, uh, uh, we call it the Great Bear, perhaps you call it the Big Dipper over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could tell the time uh, to within a minute or two just by glancing at the sky. Uh, but in the 1890s, a, a crisis developed when they found that using the Earth as a clock and using Newton's laws of motion and gravity, they found that the moon was speeding up, and this worried them. Astronomers are very picky, and they thought, well, what can be the cause? And they, one idea was, was to do with that the Earth might absorb the sun's gravity at uh, eclipses of the moon, and this would enable the moon to go faster in its orbit. That was one theory, but the other theory which they thought was much more likely was that the Earth was slowing down because of the tidal effects of the moon on the Earth and that this would um, mean that the Earth was not a good timekeeper anymore for, at the accuracy they wanted. So uh, that forced them into a, a crisis. And uh, perhaps after I've gone just a little bit further, I'll come back and say how they resolved that crisis. But uh, to continue with what Craig has, has, has just said, um, Poincaré clearly posed these two problems. And then seven years later, really quite independently of this issue of how do you get hold of a good clock and how do you define duration, Einstein, and actually, in fact, at exactly the same time, Poincaré himself, solved in an incredibly brilliant way the problem of defining definition at spatially separated points. And, and I expect many of the people watching this video will know about that. I'm, I'm not going to go into that question. But the way Einstein did that, it revealed the most extraordinary things about time, that in some senses space and time seem to be knit together in a way that you can't uh, pull them apart. And then, in fact, somebody moving relative to me at any speed would actually divide space and time in different ways, and uh, I think everybody knows about this. Right, right. Um, maybe, maybe we should get to your... Let me just finish, uh, perhaps, if oh, I may, sorry. Craig, on that one. I just wanted to say, I think that the <clears throat> huge excitement about simultaneity meant that the other issue of duration has really been forgotten, and uh, that was one of the main things I really wanted to bring out in my essay. Yeah, I think you do a wonderful job of that, and... Uh, well, I think we we should get to uh, you know the main claim of the essay, you know the the one that will uh, you know shock the audience uh, that uh, that there is no time, the end of time. Ah, you mean what onto my book or 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 in the essay, no, no, Craig? Well, the, the essay. Yes, let, let's go essay. through the essay yeah. first of all because uh, th that that's a necessary preparation. Now, um, uh, if you could. Um, if the viewers could keep on stopping our, our interview, they would see essentially a succession of snapshots of me talking here with my lips and mouth and uh, parts of my body in, in a particular position. Now, what the astronomers imagined was that you could, so to speak, take snapshots of the whole solar system because the Earth was no longer a good clock, so they were looking around for a good clock. And what they imagined was that the the solar system was a uh, was sort of like a huge big clock, and that it was obeying Newton's laws. And they said that they're going to choose time in such a way that uh, Newton's laws are satisfied when they observe the solar system. So uh, they made the assumption that. Newton's laws hold that um, uh, with respect to some time, some definition of duration, and then they looked to see where the stars, uh, where the, all the planets were, and particularly the moon, 
according to this idea that Newton's theory must be right, but then they chose time to make sure that the planets uh, were where they were according to uh, that time. So, in fact, actually, they, they put it the other way around. Rather than having a time which they had on the Earth, uh, they looked at the moon and they said, according to Newton's laws, when the moon gets to such and such a position, so much time has passed. And they called this ephemeris time. And ephemeris is a table of the positions of all the objects in the sky or a certain number of objects in the sky. And so essentially what they were doing was inverting the normal way. Theoretical physicists normally think they've got a clock and they can glance at the clock. I'm looking at my digital clock on my desk now. And they can then say, ah, I know it's um, five, uh, 12 minutes past 5 in uh, British time. Uh, the moon should be in such and such a position. I'll go out and see if the moon is in that position. But they inverted that. They said, ah, when the moon is in such and such a position relative to the stars in the sky, then it will be 12 minutes past 5. So they inverted the order of the things. They they read off time from the positions of the objects in the sky. So that's uh, the what the astronomers did. Perhaps do you want to come in at that point, Craig, and then I'll finish off the final part of what was in my essay after that, perhaps? Yeah, let me uh, come in right, right on that uh, point about um, the astronomers reading off uh, from the you know reading off uh, time from the positions of uh, the, um, the planets and, and moon and that. Um, because you, uh, I love the models you come up with, and we'll talk about those in, in a minute. Um, but then, you know, they are accompanied with this kind of genesis story of how uh, one, cer cer that certain bits are privileged over other bits, or mo more foundational. Um, so that is that the, for you, the, you know, if we just think of, uh, to make it sort of simpler for the audience, if we just think of uh, velocity, as uh, you know, so velocity is the change of positions uh, with respect to time. Then, of, then we can of course invert that to get a kind of measure of time, uh, how much time has passed uh, when uh, we look at the positions of things and their velocities and their changes of position. And so, from your essay and from your discussion here, it seems you're, th you're thinking that the what's really fundamental. Uh, is the uh, spatial locations of things and uh, the change, the rates, rates of change, the instantaneous rates of change of those things, uh, and then that time is then derived from that. Uh, is that uh, a correct? Uh, not, not quite. I would say. First of all, you're absolutely right. In my view, uh, uh, and this I think is certainly true. I can say within uh, Newtonian theory. The positions are, are really fundamental. That's when you open your eyes. If you close your eyes and open them, you see things in different positions. I'm, I'm looking out of the window straight ahead of me. I see trees in front of fields and things like that. If I move my head a bit, I see them in a slightly different position. So that's really fundamental. Now, in my essay, what I do is imagine the astronomers looking down on the solar system from above. Of course, that's not really the right way to say it, but let's think of it in those terms. And you could imagine them taking lots of snapshots which just show the positions of the sun and the planets against the background of the distant stars. And essentially, when you abstract away everything else, that's all the astronomers had to go on. There was no clock in addition ticking away to tell them how much time had passed between the snapshots. So you could imagine holding those snapshots in your hand and saying, how am I going to place those snapshots like making a, a, a card, a house out of cards that you would put the snapshots on top of each other but then raise them uh, by a certain amount which you would say guess is the amount of time that has passed. So essentially what they did was adjust those snapshots each each successive snapshot by a certain amount until the way that the uh, solar system moved, all the planets in the solar system moved, so that that 
movement then actually was in accordance with the laws that Newton had predicted. That's, that's the way they did it, so that in some senses there was no time before there. The time was extracted from the changes in the positions. That's, that's the way it's done. So, so you're going straight from something that can be visualized very well. You, you, you certainly could imagine going in a spaceship and looking down on the solar system from a great distance and literally taking those snapshots and, and, and arranging them, as I've said. And that, that's the way they thought about it. Um, so the, now there is a theoretical way which I've proposed for doing that. That's getting perhaps a little bit technical, but there is there is something called the principle of least action, which is, in my opinion, is is perhaps the most fundamental law of nature that we know. And normally, the principle of least action is used to derive Newton's equations. Uh, of motion, his laws of motion, when you presuppose there is a time. But there's an alternative way in which you can formulate it, and that's what I explained in my paper, where you don't presuppose time and separation between those snapshots, but there is a, a, a well-defined way in which you can uh, work out how the planets should be in different positions in different snapshots. As one snapshot follows another, you should be able to predict, so to speak, what the next snapshot is. And the, in the process of working that out, you also get this preferred separation between the snapshots, which is the time. So you really start with only the snapshots and the positions of the particles, and you, you can extract then the time from that. And if you have any points on that, Craig, uh, I'll, I'll pass over to you. And then I, I want to come back and say something about clocks after that, if I may. Right. Uh, well, I just wanted to ask, uh, the information on the snapshot includes the positions and uh, more than the position, right? Oh, well, no, only, only it, it, it's, it, it, inclu it gives the positions uh, essentially how far apart the planets are from each other and from the sun, and also their positions relative to the distant stars. Now, I'm taking a bit of a shortcut here because the definition of position, which is something on which I've spent uh, 45 years working, this is a very deep issue. If we try and get into that and unravel time as well, I'm afraid we'll, we'll no, no, need no, no, several no. hours, won't we? Right, I think right. you'll agree with me on that one, Craig. Yeah, but for this fun. purposes, I'm imagining that you, you can definitely see position. Now, I think this is justified because position has got to be more fundamental than time in some ways. If you think about it, uh, you can only tell that time has passed because something has moved, something has changed its position or, or something has changed. Uh, and you see this most clearly in the hand of a clock. The, 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 the hands of the clock move, and they move from one position to another, and you couldn't tell how much time had passed unless you had the dial on the back of the clock to show that the pointer had moved from uh, 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. This tells you one hour has passed. So in that sense, you see that, that time comes after position. And this is, I think, uh, well, ve very I, maybe, important. Maybe I, maybe I do have a slight uh, disagreement here about um, this. Uh, so when we actually look at something... You know, we have all these kind of motion detectors where we're really sort of change detectors, uh, we, we human beings. We have these you know, mechanisms for detecting change. And whether it's, and, and of course, to detect any kind of uh, the, the clock moving from one time to another, um, you know, we, it actually takes quite a long time, well, a half a second or so, uh, for us to process it all, uh, for even just to kind of, you know, seeing the, the, uh, second hand at a certain time and so it, the actual experience actually you know extends over a certain duration and you know we I mean not, not that we should read our physical theories from the psychology of, of uh, our psychology but still we are um, you know uh, these kind of change detectors often and so whether it's change so I see this uh, you know this change there's so there's motion, 
there's the positions and there the and there's the time. And true, we could get rid of one in favor of the other two, or any one of in front of the other in front in favor of the other two. But I'm not sure I see a rationale from our psychology for one way rather than the other way. Oh. I, I certainly agree from psychology it's um, questionable. I'm not sure how good a guide psychology is to physics. After all, yeah, it's, uh, it's abundantly it clear that the earth is not moving. <laughs> I'm sitting here quite comfortably. I can't feel anything of the earth whizzing, turning round or going round the sun. I mean, this was what... I mean, it took an immense amount of very clever arguments on Galileo's part to persuade people that the Earth was moving. Uh, so I'm not altogether sure that psychology is, is the best guide. On the other no, hand, no, I, I agree I with you that agree. you can... The, hmm? I completely agree. That's my point. Yeah. Um, I agree that you, you can say where do you look for the most primitive concepts? And uh, for me, I think... Uh, Space, spatial relationships is what holds the world together. The, 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 at its innermost core, I think it's spatial relationships that hold the world together. Uh, I know this is really going against the grain of relativity, but, but for me that, that's the most fundamental. And if you can build up the whole of physics from that one concept... You've got to put something in to get something out. Nothing will come of nothing. I completely agree with that. Uh, that's a question of, of, of uh, you know, who, who can do it best and, and the devil that's take right. the hindmost. That's right. I, I, I completely agree that, you know, every theory has certain things that are uh, brute for that theory, sort of unexplained explainers, and then it's a question of what you can do with those, the ones you choose. I was just balking at the, um, the sort of... Uh, gloss on as to why 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 choose those uh, uh, based on you know sort of immediate experience I, I don't think that we we might just while we're at it actually craig i mean i've been recently reading the famous john bell his his wonderful book speakable and unspeakable in in quantum mechanics and uh, i mean he was a huge figure as i'm sure you'll agree Yes. And it's very noticeable. He 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 instinctively thinks positions are, are are really fundamental. And he says this is in connection with all the mysteries of quantum mechanics, and we can't get into that. But one thing which I think is is very significant, he does say, ultimately, when we read the result of an experiment, we're actually seeing positions of of indicators, you know, uh, pointers, and things like that. And also, a great deal of what astronomers get is in the form of photographs or its spectra. That's actually photographic images, records, even if you like, it's printed in, in journals. Uh, it, it seems to be uh, very fundamental. Uh, personally, one of the projects I want to do is really try and pin down and, and see if one can really show that um, really, me measurements of, of lengths, really ratios of lengths, you put one ruler on top of another. I have a feeling that one could show that that is really fundamental, or at least, shall we say, that you can do all of physics with it. Uh, Feynman had a view like this. He, he, he said that he, he thought that uh, uh, positions were an adequate basis to think about everything in quantum mechanics. And, and I, I think uh, that's a, a major topic that, that should be really explored and, and, and seen if that really can be done. Oh, yeah. I definitely agree with that. And, uh, you know, in fact, I've always been a kind of fan of the... the I mean, I don't want to talk about... The, we should talk about time, but uh, I've always been a fan of the Bohm interpretation um, of quantum mechanics, which, of course, takes position as really central... Uh, or position like uh, objects. Yes, uh, yes. Actually, I've been getting into Bohm recently again. I, I, I read him about ten, twelve years ago when I was writing my book, The End of Time, and was rather impressed. But I've been interacting with people uh, who are working on Bohm, and I must say there is something very elegant and clean about it. Um, it, it it's got its problems, I, I dare say. Well, it has got problems, but in, in some senses it, it's potentially very nice. And, of course, it was very important for Bell. It, it helped him, he, as he repeatedly said, to clarify his own thinking and, and arrive at his wonderful work on the Bell inequalities. Right, right. 
and uh, and if it doesn't work for position, it's all it all falls apart. So yes, yes. Um, and there is. Let's the... get to. T- oh, sorry. Let, let's get to time. Yeah, uh, go on. Yes, time, yes. We're, we're wandering off a bit, aren't we? Um, so, uh, what, what did you want to finish uh, the, the um, discussion of the of your paper? Or well, um, on to... I think I think probably I've said enough. I mean, it's getting into a bit technical where really, you know, it's sort of equations and things. L- let me just say that there is this uh, way of um, expressing that very fundamental law, the principle of least action, where you don't put in any time at all at the start and it comes out. But then, ah, yes, what was important was about clocks. When you do this thing, the, the interesting thing, uh, and I think this is very important, and it relates to Poincaré, and I think you possibly have views about what, it, what his, his conventionalism. Mm-hmm. Poincaré, after he had this very clear discussion of the way the astronomers were going to tell uh, time by this ephemeris time, said, but this is not necessarily the only way y- you can do it. It's just the most convenient way. Now, I think that this is actually, uh, Poincaré went wrong there, and uh, I put it this way. Um, Why do we have clocks and watches? Well, it's so that we can keep appointments. And clocks and watches are no use unless they march in step. Now, if you were to take astronomers and you had one solar system and you had another solar system far away, and you had two teams of astronomers looking at these these systems, and they have no other sort, they have no clocks of their own. They've got to extract time like the astronomers did out of our own solar system. They've got to do that. Uh, And uh, one team has got to do it from one solar system, one's got to do it from another one, and then they've got to send their signals to a third party, and those signals have got to come in telling the same time. And uh, they're going to be in trouble if it isn't. And in fact, Poincaré said, you don't have to take ephemeris time, you could take any other measure of time, Mm -hmm. it just wouldn't be quite so convenient. But he didn't spot the fact that then you wouldn't be able to construct clocks, because in fact you can show that if you try and take any other measure of time, except this very special ephemeris time, which by the way is also distinguished by the fact that it, it's, it's the time in accordance with which the total energy of the system is conserved and remains constant. If you took any other motion uh, apart from this one that's defined by the ephemeris time, those two measures of time that the two teams of astronomers would generate would not march in time. So that, I think, really distinguishes that way of defining time. I believe there is an absolutely unique definition of duration, just as there is a a unique definition of entropy, which Boltzmann found. And uh, I think this is just a a subject which has got remarkably ignored, as I say, because of all the very justifiable excitement to do with the definition of simultaneity and the creation of relativity theory. Yeah, I, I've always uh, this is one of the things I've always loved about your work is is your focus on duration and uh, you know we philosophers of science always teach uh, Poincaré and and Reichenbach and their kind of conventionalist picture and uh, I was always and this discussion was very helpful because I always wondered whether you went as far as uh, Poincaré and Reichenbach and it seems like uh, the answer is no um, in in the sense that so you know Reichenbach and Poincaré ask you know what uh, is there a fact of the matter about whether this uh, interval of time is the same length as this, you know, later interval of time? And uh, you know, they say it's 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 definitional, you know, given given the setup of uh, there is no fact, there is no external fact of the matter about it. Uh, so I could choose other ones, and uh, they would all be equally good from us from the point of view of the world and you know nature. Um, but they wouldn't be as equally good from the point of view of you know we human uh, scientists. Um, no, I, I no. think that's, if I may come in, I think that's definitely. By the way, let me also say that when you look at general relativity as a dynamical theory, you find that local proper time in general relativity 
turns out to be exactly like ephemeris time in Newtonian theory. So this is actually built into general relativity and uh, has emerged from the work I've been doing with my collaborators. So it's, uh, I, I think you really can say time emerges from change. There is this famous saying of Ernst Mach, who said it's utterly beyond our power to measure the changes of things by time. Much rather time is an abstraction at which we arrive uh, from the changes of things. And this is, this is brilliantly confirmed within general relativity in a way in which I think very few people are aware of. So I'm, I'm doing my best to make people know about it. It's, uh, I mean, there is another question because the, you know, Poincaré and Reichenbach were motivated by their, I mean, motivated to, to this position from, uh, well, especially Reichenbach, uh, because Poincaré already had it before general relativity. But uh, in Reichenbach's case, uh, it was, uh, you know, thinking about general relativity and curved spaces uh, and space times that really motivated uh, this thinking that, you know, with a me- what, you know, why should I think a meter stick here is the same length as a meter stick over there, especially if the space time might be curved. And as I transport it, its uh, length is, is changing. Um, but anyway, this you know uh, remind reminds me to ask you the question I want to ask about. Uh, so you could uh, think of the same the same kind of argument with respect to duration as with respect to length. Um, and I know you uh, have worked on this as well. Yes. Now um, this is this is ongoing work. You're you're absolutely right to pose this question, and. Uh, let me say that for well for centuries people have made statements like this if the whole universe were moved six feet to the right you couldn't see that anything had happened so it's ridiculous to think that you can move the whole universe around then there are statements like if you rotated it through ten degrees the whole universe absolutely everything again you couldn't tell anything. So that's meaningless to say things like that. Then you get things like, uh, statements like, if all the speeds of all the motions in the universe were doubled overnight, again, you couldn't tell that anything had happened because all the clocks and all your bodily processes would run twice as fast. So that's, again, a meaningless statement. And and the, the last one is... Um, if all of the lengths in the universe were doubled, again, uh, and si- all the sizes doubled, again, you couldn't notice anything. Now, uh, that's a sort of very intuitive way of doing that. Now, there's a, there's a sort of way in which you can make that mathematically precise. Uh, it's closely related to what's known as gauge theory, which is now recognized as very fundamental. And you find that general relativity meets all of these requirements very well, except doesn't quite uh, satisfy the one about size, that last one there. And in fact, that's a very interesting question, because that's exactly what makes the expansion of the universe possible. In, 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 In some way, general relativity is not perfectly a theory of general relativity. It's not relative with respect to everything. In fact, there's a very remarkable representation of general relativity when, just as in my picture, there's no time between my snapshots. When I started off, there's no time between the snapshots. In general relativity, you can start off by saying that at any instant, in, uh, you can take a spatial volume, a three-dimensional spatial volume of, of the universe. This is a closed universe I'm thinking of where, where you can see this particularly clearly. And there's no way of saying where the volume is distributed. What, what you can say is that it has a certain total volume, but uh, you in a way, you can put that, you can put that, distribute that volume wherever you like at, at the fundamental level before you start working out the laws of how that universe evolves. And then you find that when it satisfies Einstein's equations in some rather wonderful way, it distributes that volume in, in specific places so that what we see as length here somehow is determined by the totality of the universe 
and the fact that the whole universe is satisfying Einstein's equations. Now, that's, that's probably rather difficult to grasp, but the one thing which is very mysterious in general relativity is that the still... The total volume is something which is absolute according to uh, general relativity, and it's and it's just that one extra thing which allows the universe to expand and gives this phenomenal success of the Big Bang cosmology and all the wonderful explanations for the redshift and things that come out of this. And uh, just in case people think I'm I'm quite mad. Back in 1917-18, just after Einstein had created general relativity, the great mathematician Hermann Weyl noticed that the mathematical framework, Riemannian space, which is the basis of general relativity, has in some senses that length is absolute in it. Directions are not absolute, but length is absolute. And he tried to create a new theory in which uh, length is not absolute, and he thought that he'd managed to create a new theory in which gravity and electromagnetism were unified. He was hugely excited about it, but unfortunately Einstein immediately saw a, a major problem with it and, and described the theory to his friends as inspired nonsense. Nevertheless, <laughs> Einstein got eventually very hooked on it as well. And then, remarkably, ten years later, this then became the basis of gauge theory when after quantum mechanics had been discovered. So actually the mathematics of Weyl's idea was only very slightly changed and it led on to gauge theory, first in, in the late 1920s and then in the mid-1950s when uh, the full-blown gauge theories, Yang-Mills theories were developed, which now explain all of particle physics that we know in an extraordinarily beautiful way. So thinking about these things uh, can pay dividends. Um, so it's not such a crazy idea to ask about uh, the relativity of length, but there remains this one strange mystery in general relativity and, and a friend of mine says there seems to be a, a curse on relativity of size. It's, a, it's such an attractive idea, but um, it just doesn't seem to work out. Lots and lots of people have tried to, to do it, and I'm one of them, but nobody has quite succeeded. It, it seems to thwart us. And, and Vile at the end of his life said ruefully that somehow or other length does seem to be absolute, and he suspected that was put in by quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't always get what we want. Uh, with the magnetic monopoles, we'd like those, but we don't have them. And, uh, well, we'll see. Um, okay, should we move on to other topics? And Yes, do, yes, um, yes. Do you, what, what, what would you like to suggest? Um, well, I wouldn't mind uh, talking a little bit about, uh, you know, why I, why I think... Uh, uh, Everyone has a, a sort of conception of a kind of privileged and special now, um, and I'd like to maybe talk a little bit about that, um, and uh, then any, anything else you like, like the, the flow of time and the uh, uh, difference between time and space, and anything like that. Yeah, fine. Um, Do you want to start on the now then, Craig? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so it's it's really, a, a, I'm, I'm really very fascinated by uh just the sort of general fact that you know when you look at the science when you look at physics and you look at time and physics it does not seem to have many of the features that it has that they tend to give uh, to it an experience and so our experience of time is very complicated in various ways but also apart from the experience there's this kind of manifest image of time that we find almost ir irresistible you know, so we find it almost irresistible to divide the universe into a, you know, there's fundamentally different sectors that we call the past, the present, and the future. And we think of the past as really this, you know, um, thing that's happened to all these events and that there's this really fundamental uh, difference between the two. And it can really affect the way we think about our lives, right? So we take people, in the, you know, the ordinary person in the street will think that the past is very settled. Uh, the future is open. Uh, they think the present is that little bit of time in which you can act, uh, you know, sort of freely. And they, you know, you don't think that if I wiggle something now, it'll 
change where I was born. Uh, but you think if I wiggle something now, it might change where I die. Um, and so you, you, there's this kind of massive causal asymmetry as well. And so I'm very interested in, but then if I look into, and so people talk about time flowing, about this kind of special privilege now, which is updating itself. Um, but then when you look into the, uh, the science uh, and the, the physics of time, you don't see a privilege now that you won't find a kind of highlighter saying this is the now as opposed to this other moment. Um, there's no, you know, you are here uh, sign on the map. Uh, if you thought of it, the space-time manifold is a big map. There's no you are here uh, thing like you see uh, if, uh, when, you, you know, when you're a tourist in some place and look at the map. Um, and there's no flow, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's not obvious exactly where the directionality comes from either. And so I've got a sort of big project of trying to uh, reconcile as best I can the, the, the now, I mean, the, the, the sort of manifest image of time with the scientific image of time. Um, I think it's a problem that hasn't been really worked on all that all that much, and so I'm very interested in trying to you know so sort of piece these two together. Um, and so right now I've been thinking a lot about uh, why we think about why we th why we think that there's a privilege now, uh, but we don't think there's a privilege here, a spatial here. Um, well, why we think that? Well, if you think about uh, you know, speeds of things like the, uh, if I, if we were actually in the same room, Julian, then you would be, you know, you would see light bouncing off my face and my lips moving, and then there would be the sound coming much later. But your brain would be integrating the two into this uh, and ma matching them uh, together really quite well. And your brain, in fact, has all sorts of mechanisms and tricks for detecting whether sensory information comes from the same uh, uh, event or not. Uh, sometimes these tricks go awry, and that's how we, we learn about these mechanisms. Uh, but uh, it, we, there's this whole system of uh, temporal integration where we're constantly integrating all this information. And the re end result of it is that I don't need to kind of, I don't need to put a kind of time stamp on when I talk to you. If I talk to you about something that's in our immediate uh, uh, lo you know, location, and I say, you know, look at that chair, it's orange, or something like that. And the lag time it takes for our brains to process that and the communication, um, most macroscopic properties will stay the same uh, through that interval. And that's, in fact, due to these temporal integration mechanisms, plus the speed of, sight, uh, speed of uh, light and, and, uh, and uh, sound, and how quickly these things work. As opposed to, you know, if you were to try to communicate uh, by smell, you know, the, if you walk into a house and you uh, smell burnt toast, it doesn't give you a very reliable indication of, you know, when that exactly happened. And so the end result of this is that if you look at those features, and then you also add some physics and the fact that, uh, you know, there's no time travel, uh, or it doesn't seem like there's any time travel, so I can't go to you. So with space travel, I can go back and forth along any axis. And so I could. So if you say you're here is is uh, special, well then I could go. You know, will it take a, a long time? But I could take a, take a plane and get to Oxford and see you're here and say, well, it's it's nice here in Oxford, but it's uh, but it's uh, you know not metaphysically special in some way. Um, and you could do the same in, about San Diego, but we can't do that about other. We can't travel to other you know distant points in the past, and so or any points in the past. And so you've got all these people going around with these heads, uh, taking into account, not needing to st stamp any kind of uh, date stamp on, on things. We don't need to synchronize watches when we're talking to each other. And so it's quite natural for us to come up with this idea of a, a distinguished now. There'll be massive intersubject, you know, the relativity of simultaneity won't be, isn't, uh, you know, observable in ordinary context. Um, and uh, so it's quite natural uh, in a, such a world for us to have a lot of vast intersubjective agreement about these sort of local, pat, what I call pre pat, present patches. And since there is this wide intersubjective agreement, it's natural for us to think that there's this kind of objective difference between the two. Uh, I mean, objective difference between the past and the future. Um, 
And so I'm trying to do my best to try to explain these things. But um, one thing I'm curious about, Julian, is uh, one thing I want to work on and have worked on to some extent is uh, I, so I'm trying to get uh, reproduce our way of thinking about you know, why, why we might be misled into thinking that there's this kind of a completely objective past, present, and future. And so I'm curious about what you think about whether you think that that is a kind of illusion. But then also I'm interested very much in the directionality aspect to, to this. Um, and so many people will look, you know, to thermodynamics and the increase of entropy. Um, but I know you have a, your own view uh, about this as well. And so I wonder what you think about um, both the kind of uh, division of the world into, uh, you know, past, present, and future, uh, whether that is a kind of illusion, like I think, or uh, whether it's really, you know, tracking something fundamental. Um, so I guess the question is, yes, yeah, sort of how fundamental is the kind of three plus one picture you have? Um, and then the other thing is really about uh, the thermodynamic arrow or the causal arrow. The, f the fact that I, why, why do I, why do I remember the, uh, why, why do I, well, why do I, why do I know more about the past than the future? Right. Well, um, well, first of all, what you were saying earlier on about the uh, psychological stuff, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me, but uh I think that's that's all at the level uh, rather far removed from fundamental physics. I mean, I'm sure it's worth oh, thinking about those things. I think you'd probably agree with me. It's it's not so much at the you're you're trying to reconcile sort of uh, the way the brain works and our psychological experience with with what fundamental physics is telling us. Now, uh, as regards um, my ideas uh, about that, uh, well, I share with you. Uh, the idea that, that to, a, to a great extent time is an illusion, but it's a, a very well-founded illusion in my view. Now, in fact, when I came to start thinking about all these things, this came out of work that uh, Paul Dirac did uh, 50 years ago now on trying to put together, meld general relativity with quantum theory. And in the process, he and at the same time uh, Arnavit, Deser and Misner in the United States uh, started looking at general relativity not as a four-dimensional uh, geometrical theory of space-time but as a dynamical theory what you've referred to as the three plus one <laughs> split and uh, what um, Dirac was very struck by was that when you ask if you are if you ask what is actually happening in general relativity. Is there a sense in which you can say things happen in general relativity in the same way as they happen in Newtonian dynamics? He discovered that it's, it's, what is really happening is that three-dimensional space is changing. It's, not, it's, not, it's confusing to think about four-dimensional space if you're, if you're thinking about it as a dynamical theory. And Dirac made a very remarkable statement, and he repeated it in an article in the Scientific American in 1963, saying that he was so impressed by this fact that it's the three-dimensional geometry which is changing, and he saw that this greatly simplified the structure of general relativity when you looked at it this way. And he said just one sentence, which completely changed my life. He said, this result uh, makes me question whether four-dimensional symmetry is, is a fundamental feature of the physical world. And mm -hmm. it was this that s started making me think about what is time. And so I've... Uh, and, and now this is... Uh, horrendous to many people and, and they really don't like it but if you if once you get into it you you it becomes quite natural to you to think about it and in fact um, last year when it was the 100th anniversary of Minkowski's famous lecture on, on creating space time uh, I was invited to a conference and the title of my talk was was space time a glorious historical accident and mm -hmm. I think there's quite a strong argument for that anyway uh, the way I like to think about things is that there are uh, it's, it's that snapshot image that I had at the start I like to think of what's really fundamental is 
three-dimensional configurations of the entire universe. So, so think of them as three-dimensional snapshots, that those are the really fundamental things. Now, um, if can you, I ask you, you can could I imagine a... vast numbers of them, and they're not ordered in any line like that. It's just they, ha they exist in a space of possibilities. Do you want to come in? I think you wanted to make a comment there, Craig. Oh, yeah, I was just going to ask whether um, I think I can, I can see, uh, and I, I have very similar views in a way when we then, when we come to think about quantizing, uh, you know, come to quantum gravity. Yes. Um, are you also motivated in this uh, sort of anti Minkowski way even before quantum considerations? Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, I, I came to this. Um well, I, I didn't want to throw overboard Minkowski. I'm now really seriously thinking that actually maybe Minkowski was a mistake. Um, I'll stick my neck out on that. Um, I'm not saying he was, but I think there's a serious case to be argued. Um, no, I, I very much developed uh, this idea of sort of three-dimensional snapshots as fundamental uh, from thinking about the problem of what is motion. And um, and these, uh, the, the, the interesting thing in quantum mechanics is that quantum mechanics is defined on what is called a configuration space. Now, you can think of configuration space as all of the possible snapshots that you could have of the universe. All possible configurations of the universe belong to this, the configuration space of the universe. And they're not arranged in a, in a line like Newton thought and, 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 and everybody thinks. There's no, um, there's no line like that. And, and quantum mechanics, the, the, sh the wave function that Schrodinger introduced, is defined on, on, on a configuration space. So in some senses it gives a probability, uh, different values of the probability for each of these possible configurations. And that's the picture that emerges from uh, the so-called canonical approach to uh, quantum gravity. And the remarkable thing is that time disappears altogether from this picture. These probabilities are given once and for all. They're static. Now, this result doesn't surprise me at all, and it didn't surprise me one iota when I came to it, because I'd already been convinced long before that that time was an illusion. So it was very nice to see it, so to speak, spelt out clearly in, 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 in quantum gravity. Then, of course, we face the question of how do we recover time uh, or our appearance of time? And that led me to uh, introduce a concept that I call time capsules, uh, and I got this from, from geology. Now, if you think about geology, 200 years ago, people were convinced that the universe, the Earth, had been created something like 6,000 years ago. But then the geologists started making all sorts of discoveries. They started looking at fossils, rocks. These are things that are unchanging, basically. The, the, the things that the geologists examined 200 years ago, essentially they're still there in the rocks in North Wales and places like that where Darwin went with his professor. And it was by looking at the patterns, the structures in these rocks, they started to say there's such a lot of correlations between these things. These are, these are connected in such amazing ways we are finding mutually consistent records. We, we are finding evidence of a past, some immensely long past they interpreted it, uh, that has evolved. There was some process. It, it took place in accordance with the then known laws, and we find the records of it around us. And anything that you pick up. Your own brain is a time capsule, if you think about it. There's, there's an immense amount of information in there. It's all mutually consistent records. So for me, this is very much my image, in some sense, of a now, is a configuration which is full of mutually consistent records that tell us that we have a past. And so, I mean, we we never have access to the past. The only reason we think we have a, a past is because we have all these vivid memories 
in our heads now. I remember you invited me ten years ago to uh, contribute to that, that nice volume you did on physics meets um, philosophy at the Planck length, and I think you'll agree that you remember that. Yes. Um, so it's all this mutual consistency of the records that leads us to say there's a past. So how do you, how do you feel about that? Yes. So uh, yeah, just so the audience is, uh, I mean, gets the idea. Um, so the time capsule does not. So it has all these records of the past, but really there was no past. Or maybe that's not the way to put it. But uh, what's the way to? So there is a skepticism about the past there, um, but there may be other time capsules. So there would be some fossils, which are you know record up to a certain date. And some other fossils that have correlations uh, up to a, what we would call another date, um, but that really then there is no. So you know, if I just think of you know the snap right now, uh, this moment. So this is a time capsule. It has all these correlations which indicate that I was born somewhere and that we had uh, contributed to this book. Um, but there is no. Pe but that. But. Is the way I put it that there is there is no there is no past? There, there is there is uh, in my view there is no past in the way one normally thinks about it. But there are all these other configurations that the universe could have, and in some senses they're all when when you look at which configuration is more probable according to the what is thought to be the fundamental equation in, 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 in quantum gravity, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, discovered uh, 40 years ago by Bryce DeWitt, uh, uh, who was prodded into it by John Wheeler, as Bryce said, I only found that damned equation to get John Wheeler off my back. <laughs> um, but I think he was quite proud of the equation, in fact. Um, that, uh, when you ask why does one configuration get a greater probability than another, that comes about because all of the configurations have to be taken into account. It's, uh, I describe it as a, as a beauty contest in eternity, <laughs> that there's, it's, it's almost as if some, uh, let's take a God's eye view of this, is contemplating all the possible configurations the universe could be in, not selecting just one. This is not a, a case of uh, Leibniz's the best world being selected, but actually giving a ranking to them and saying, oh, well, this one is going to get more probability than that one. And my conjecture is that actually the, the ones that are time capsules seem to that, that have contain what look like mutually consistent records are the ones that get the highest probability. Now um, I've put this idea forward in my book The End of Time which, which was published ten years ago um, I think it, it it, I think it is a logically possible uh, explanation. There's a huge amount of work needs to be done on it to see that if it, it, it really makes sense and, and, and stands up to uh, closer examination. But, but I think it is a qualitative uh, possibility. Now, are you thinking that, yes, so if uh, that panned out, that there would be a connection then between the probabilities... Uh, um, there and uh, the ones you get in thermodynamics. So well, would there be a link between that and the thermodynamic arrow? Well, we know that we know from the facts of thermodynamics. Let, let me perhaps throw in one or two more things. First of all, um, uh, the we know that entropy increases in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics, and we know that records, all the structure we see around us, could not form if the universe had not started, this is in the, in the normal way of talking about the Big Bang, if the universe had not started in, in an extraordinarily special state of very, very low entropy. Uh, Roger Penrose, uh, very well-known uh, mathematician and relativist, he is always emphasizing, and absolutely rightly, that 
This is one of the most amazing things about the universe. It has started in an extraordinarily special state. So we have this huge asymmetry. And this, uh, Roger is quite right, this asymmetry of the very low entropy of the Big Bang, because statistically you would expect the entropy to be uh, quite high at the Big Bang and, the, uh, and, and uh, not, not so incredibly low as it is. This, this is a most unusual state of affairs. And uh, the question is, uh, well, first of all, that's the explanation in a way why we can be aware of a past at all. If, if we weren't in a low entropy universe, it would be just like being in the sun in, in thermal equilibrium and essentially mm -hmm. no life or anything would be possible. Now, the question is, is there any possible explanation for that remarkable asymmetry? Now, I believe there is. If you actually consider all possible configurations, you look in what I've called this configuration space of the, the universe, uh, you see that some configurations are completely different from others. There are ones that are very, very uniform. There are others that are very highly structured. This configuration space of the universe, in a way, is incredibly asymmetric. This is something, again, which I find you don't find in textbooks. People don't point this out. But if you actually start thinking about it, you realize that a, the configuration space it is incredibly structured, very asymmetric. So we have, I believe, two huge asymmetries when we think about things. We have the huge asymmetry of our life, the difference between birth and death, recollection of the past. Uh, we have this extraordinarily rich picture that science has built up of evolution, of cosmology from the Big Bang, geology, all of these things. And we have the indications that if we try and put quantum mechanics together with uh, relative general relativity, we finish up with a static universe in which we just have probabilities for different configurations of the universe. So what determines those? And I think a major factor in this must be the asymmetry of the configuration space. But I fear I've talked rather too much in this discussion, uh, Craig, and I'm not quite sure we should be stopping fairly soon, should we? What do you think? I think do, that's right. Should we perhaps uh, be winding it up bit by bit? Do you want to sort of say your things and, and perhaps wind it up that way? Um, okay, what are those things? Uh, well, uh, let's see. Um Well, uh, well, I don't know. Do you want to just stop, or do, what do you want to do? Well, <laughs> the people will curse us for ending like this. I'm afraid I was a bit naughty in um, suddenly throwing that at you. Um, I, uh, I think, um, I think we've probably covered a pretty good lot. I mean, uh, I think that's right. we we were asked to, I think, to uh, talk at the start about my. Uh, my essay, and we certainly covered that uh, very generously. Uh, we wandered on into these things that are of great interest to the to both of us. So, um, I would say sh perhaps we should call it a day. We, we've gone for an hour and five minutes, according to my clock. So you see, right. I don't believe in time, but I'm very punctual, and I'm always yes. looking at the clock. <laughs> so perhaps on that cheery note, shall we shall we call it a day? Okay, that yeah. sounds good to me. Yeah, great okay, to well, talk to you. Well, thank you very much for the conversation. Yeah, great to talk to you, Craig. Okay, really wonderful. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.